In today's Farm Report, last Wednesday, the European Union lifted its quota system on milk production. Jim Sulfur with the University of Minnesota Extension Service Office has more. In addition to being in Canada about a month or so ago, I was also over in Wisconsin. And at the Wisconsin conference I was at, they had brought in one producer from Ireland and one producer from Germany talking about what those countries might do or how they're going to deal with uh, quota coming off. Uh, For folks that may not be familiar, the quota is coming off in Europe, and it's all of Europe. April 1st, so it's actually off right now, and just talked about their perspective and kind of their country's perspective and what might happen. I thought that was really an interesting conversation. Uh, Mike Murphy was a producer from Ireland, and he currently milked about 120 cows. He was bringing in a son. He had purchased another farm. They were remodeling a parlor, So when and that farm was a heifer farm. And so when that uh, quota comes off, they're going to hope to expand to about 200 cows or so in the next year. Um, They've had a quota since about 1983, so it's been a long, long time. Uh, The country of Ireland actually has a goal of increasing production, milk production, by about 50% by 2020. They're really a country a little like New Zealand and the other hemisphere, but basically the same type of dairying, very grass-based dairy. Uh, They graze about 285 days out of the year. Uh, They get a lot of rain. The average temperature is maybe between 30 and 70, 80 degrees, so it's kind of nice weather for uh, weather for dairy cows. And overall, his concept of what Ireland is doing is the processes are expanding. Uh, young farmers are pretty excited because with the quota coming off, they're able to expand. One of the challenges they're probably going to have in Ireland, just like here with young producers getting started, is land is very expensive. And with a land-based dairy in Ireland, that's, you know, you need land, and so it's kind of expensive to get started. Uh, The other producer was from Germany, kind of a little different take. He had more of a confinement dairy. He's kind of been growing since about 1991, didn't grow up on a dairy farm, so he's kind of been growing internally and purchasing a little quota. Um, His biggest concern, which I think we take for granted here, is with their uh, quota system, they don't have any kind of safety net, and they've never had any kind of risk management systems built into their system. And so they have no futures contracts. They have no contracts with the creamery. There's nothing like that. And so he's really concerned with this volatility that he has no way to go out and protect himself in a period of good prices. Um, The other thing just to know that they don't get reimbursed for any of this quota. That quota, if you purchase quota last year and it disappears, you can write that off in your taxes as a loss, but you don't really get any quota. So I think real interesting perspective on what might be happening over in Europe from a couple of producers' perspectives. This has been Jim Selfer with the University of Minnesota Extension in St. Cloud. The Minnesota Board of Animal Health reported two more cases of H5N2 avian influenza in Minnesota yesterday. One located in a commercial turkey flock in Stearns County, the other in Candy, Ohio. The Stearns County case brings that county to three confirmed barn infections. Health officials say that there is no risk to the public and that food safety is not a concern. The dairy industry has had its message changed over the years when it comes to growth. Jim Sulfur with the University of Minnesota Extension Service Office has more on the new message that they're trying to purvey to younger farmers and those looking to continue the legacy. I've done some radio programs talking about the Path Forward kind of research project that Midwest Dairy Association has been through. Um, There was a dairy summit that was going on, and maybe you haven't heard a lot about the program since then, uh, but believe me, there's a lot of work going on be- behind the scenes, both at the educational institutions, at least I can speak from a University of Minnesota standpoint, from an extension standpoint, Minnesota Milk Producers Association, Midwest Dairy Association, trying to really develop resources or be thinking about what resources a dairy industry or specifically dairy producers need to try and move forward and to really... Um, to really grow their businesses or uh, restructure their businesses so they can be relevant long-term. 
something else where it really happened and kind of the impetus behind this is that Minnesota has been dropping in ranking among the states. Now that doesn't mean our industry has been shrinking. We have been growing about a oh, 0 to 2% per year in milk production over about the last 10 years. But one of the concerns is there's some other states around us, primarily Michigan, that's been growing quite a bit more, more rapidly than we have. South Dakota on a percentage basis, Iowa on a percentage basis, Wisconsin's been growing. And I think the thought is if those states are growing in dairy why can't Minnesota grow a little bit faster than we currently have? Um, currently, for people that may not be familiar, we rank eighth in, min, in the U.S. in milk production. And uh, 15 years ago or so, we were fifth. So we have slipped between, behind kind of Texas. And, of course, Idaho passed us a number of years ago. And now Michigan has passed us. And so we need to be thinking about what we can do to re reinvigorate the dairy industry. And I think the message is better than it was maybe 10 or 15 years ago. At that point, the message was you need to get bigger. You need to get to 600 cows. And I think that really turned off a lot of dairy producers because they really didn't see any desire to hire 10 or 15 people and go to 600 cows. I think the change has really focused now that we want to support all the dairy industries and dairy industries by the dairy industry and dairy producers by nature are very creative and so I think our goal is to determine what kind of mechanisms can we put in to support all dairy industry or dairy producers of all sizes whatever they might want to be you're seeing more dairy producers that are doing doing value added some are going to robots and diversifying their operations uh, their focus is to keep their debt down and make a lot of margin per cow and so I, I think our goal, at least I can speak from a university, that we want to support all that. So if you've got some ideas, make sure you let some people in the dairy industry know and what we need. And if you're young producers, let us know what we need to help support you. If you're an older producer, I would encourage you to think about, can you bring somebody in and really uh, continue to grow this industry that's really very strong, particularly here in central Minnesota. This has been Jim Selfer with the University of Minnesota Extension in St. Cloud. You may have heard of a bioeconomy, but what does that mean to you? Jonathan Mayle of the Energy Department, speaking to an audience at this year's Agricultural Outlook Forum, said one way to put it is... Bioeconomy refers to a set of economic activities relating to the invention, development, production, and use of biological products and processes. Or taking products ranging from woody biomass to pond algae, with the end result... An array of products, liquid fuels, chemicals, ethanol, electricity, heat and steam... And Mail says the potential this has economically to our nation is this. Revenue and economic growth, broad spectrum of new jobs, rural developments, advanced technologies and manufacturing, reducing emissions and environmental sustainability, export potential of technologies, maintaining the competitive advantage of the U.S., and investments in new infrastructure. Yet he adds a balanced approach is needed to build financial support, infrastructure, and cost-effective products to grow the bioeconomy. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. The agricultural industry has seen a record high profitability in the last decade, part of what economists call a super cycle. But as Jim Sulfur with the University of Minnesota Extension Service Office reports, that super cycle may be ending. I was at a conference a couple weeks ago and David Cole was a speaker kind of talking about the economics very familiar name among anyone around the ag industry and he does a lot of speaking kind of a real practical applied kind of economist that's retired a few years ago from Virginia Tauk and now he does a lot of speaking I think he does a lot of speaking in Minnesota as much as anywhere and of course anyone in ag and has heard him over the last couple of years talked about this super cycle of agriculture we've been in for about the last 10 years or so with every year it seemed like prices were up a little bit higher profitability was really good especially among the crop segments uh, the livestock segments really varied a lot some years they had good years some years they didn't but it clearly appears like that super cycle of profitability is maybe over and we're going to go into more of a, a period that is more traditional and and one of the challenges is when you come out of these super cycles your costs are still high so rental costs are very high land costs are still high input costs are high but our prices that we receive for our products particularly crops is really down to a more nor normal level that it's been and so just encouraging people how to maybe prepare for that 
The other thing that's kind of happening is it looks like the world economy is maybe slowing down a little bit. One of the, the comments he had, which I think was really interesting, said China used more concrete in uh, more concrete and steel in just the years 2011 and 2012 than the U.S. did for the entire 20th century. And that kind of puts into perspective how fast China really grew during that period of time. Now, the economy still predicted to grow, but maybe not as fast as it has in the past. Um, some of the other things that's been happening, the biofuels mandate is kind of softening. You can hear a lot of resistance in Congress to kind of this biofuels mandate. Uh, the central bank stimulus is over, and so we're probably likely to see some increases in interest rates. So if you're in the ag community, I think you need to be thinking about these global trends that you're seeing and how that might affect your business and how you might be prepared for to be a little more resilient maybe than on this rapid growth pace than we've had in the past. This has been Jim Selfer with the University of Minnesota Extension in St. Cloud.